So we're back for the afternoon panel um, on digital copyright registries and similar animals. Uh, we are uh, really grateful to have seven panelists with us this afternoon um, from different organizations doing uh, registries of some sort. Um, and this was Mike sort of set the context for this earlier, talking about the different approaches, whether it's build and they will come, or um, providing it as a side benefit or as, you know, as a side effect of doing something else. So. Um, each one of them is going to talk a little bit about what they're doing, and uh, five to ten-ish minutes, please. And, uh, and then we'll have time for questions, and then uh, after this panel, we'll have a plenary session uh, where we can also continue to discuss these um, sort of questions about registries, et cetera, uh, that might come up during these talks. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Devin Copley uh, from Noank Media. Hi, folks. Um, so I got, I'm all wireless here, so I figure I'll wander around the room a little bit. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of Noank, so I just want to provide a little bit of an introduction to um, what we're doing and how we are coming to the whole um, the problem of registries. So Noank Media is a, uh, a company that was spun off from the Berkman Center at uh, Harvard Law um, about a year and a half ago. Um, it's based on um, the work that uh, Terry Fisher and some of his colleagues have been doing um, on uh, the what's become known as the alternative compensation model. So that's um, uh, basically finding another way to uh, locate some revenue for uh, owners of digital content. Um, so my name is Devin Copley. I'm the CTO of the company, and uh, I'm just going to go as quickly as possible through some of the uh, technology um, and the technological challenges and how we're uh, involved with this whole uh, registry thing. So first, let me get to the, the model. Um, NOAC is formed to essentially try to solve the problem of uh, how uh, creators of media can get paid uh, in a post-piracy era. Um, so currently, um, one of the biggest ways that people get content is through P2P systems, of course. Unlicensed P2P systems, everybody knows this problem. Um, but one of the things that, that we recognize and that I want to point out is that nobody really wins in the unlicensed P2P world. Um, consumers may get a bunch of free content, but they don't get the quality or the authenticity of the content they're looking for. Um, content that isn't very popular is very difficult to find on P2P networks because there's no incentive for users to make it or for content owners to make it available. Um, download performance is poor because ISPs uh, are restricting bandwidth utilization of P2P programs because they're not making any revenue off it. Um, there's a lot of stuff on this slide. I don't need to go through all of them. But for the other players in, the, in this system here, uh, end users, creators and publishers, and internet service providers, um, the, the status quo just isn't working for anybody. Um, obviously, creators and publishers can't get paid. And ISPs are liable for copyright liability. They've got bandwidth costs for P2P traffic. And we feel like there is an opportunity here for essentially a, a bargain between these three, um, these three stakeholders that will provide benefits to all of them. And that is essentially, um, that's the basis of our model. Um, it's a model wherein uh, end users as a group pay a, uh, a license to ISPs or other gatekeepers, and in return they get uh, content. Um, creators and publishers have to give up their DRM and they have to give up the idea of having pricing control and retail uh, control over their content. But uh, in return, they get money. And the ISPs receive the licenses and technology that are required in order to enable them to increase the efficiency of their network with, uh, with caching. Um, so that's the, the basic framework of the deal. And uh, it's called, you know, this is not something that's... Uh, totally new. It's something that's been discussed for a number of years now. It's got, some people call it the alternative compensation model. Some people call it blanket licensing. Well, we're actually trying to, uh, to build it. Um, so uh, this is a, sorry, this slide is um, that it's possible to actually do smaller scale versions of this, um, of this kind of a deal. Um, you don't necessarily need an ISP involved. Um, ideally, you can have uh, blanket licensing with other smaller uh, middlemen, such as device manufacturers, educational institutions, interest groups, anyone who, who wants to um, 
connect uh, users with content. So what we're doing is we're trying to develop a uh, blanket licensing engine, uh, a, a technological platform that will support these sorts of deals, support these sorts of uh, blanket licensing deals wherein a, uh, a pile of content is paid for by um, one uh, by one or more uh, intermediary parties on behalf of uh, a group of consumers. Um, and the goals are to bundle the content with things that people are used to paying for, make the content feel free to users, and, uh, and distribute the proceeds on a pro rata basis based on the usage of content. So I'm moving sort of quickly through this stuff. It, obviously, the implications and the problems of this sort of a model are well outside the scope of what we're talking about today. I'm happy to talk to anybody, uh, you know, buttonholed in the hall after, uh, after we're done here. So um, Joy Ito was just talking about um, the continuum of different sorts of rights. And um, that's a really useful concept, I think. And we see ourselves as falling on that continuum. So if you can see over on the uh, copy left side, um, you've got uh, the open extreme and the free and as in beer extreme of content, which includes um, share alike sorts of licenses. Um, and then as you move you know, further to the copyright side, um, you get towards uh, the CC plus concept, and uh, which you know requires some sort of separate negotiation for commercial licenses. And then on the far right, you've got the closed retail sales model that is dominant, uh, has been dominant until recently. And we see the NOAC blanket licensing model as filling that uh, middle space there between CC plus and uh, and full on copyright. Um, so the vision is to create a general purpose uh, engine to uh, enable this, uh, this, this, uh, these sorts of deals. Uh, Nathan, how am I doing on time? Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> All right, well, I got a lot of slides to get through, so I'll, I'll skip real quick. Um, the technology that we've got consists of a number of major subsystems. Um, the, uh, there is a registry for storing metadata about content. There is a, um, a modified uh, P2P network for distributing content. It's essentially a modification of BitTorrent, which I won't talk about because we won't have time. Um, there's a subsystem for uh, monitoring usage and tracking usage and being able to distribute royalties on uh, proportional to usage. And then there's the user interface components. So we'll just focus quickly on the registry. Um, there's the block diagram of the whole thing. Um, the registry being the red stuff up in the upper right-hand corner. So we'll focus on what we've been building for the registry. Um, essentially, it's a RESTful API with an XML representation that allows uh, users to obtain metadata about content that's registered in the system um, to uh, determine uh, what sort of licenses are available. And when I say what sort of licenses are available, um, we're talking about uh, we've designed to be able to handle licenses in uh, any sort of media, in any territory across, uh, across the world, and to be able to handle multiple different sorts of licensing for the same uh, piece of content uh, in different uh, contexts. So uh, among the kinds of licenses we can support in our data model is CC licenses and public domain licenses, um, but then also our, our licenses, which have... Uh, additional terms. A CC license, of course, you know, once you grant a CC license, is essentially irrevocable. Um, but our our license terms for this essentially commercial service um, have expiry dates and all sorts of other uh, 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 parameters as well that we keep track of. Um, the data model that we're building, or that we've largely built, um, is really um, focused on licensing data. We don't see ourselves as um, and IMDB or Music Brains, we're not really trying to, uh, you know, collect metadata about the user experience. Although we do have to present some of that sort of thing, uh, we are really focused on being an accurate and reliable uh, indicator of the licensing terms for content that has been registered with us. Um, as I said, we support CC NOAC and public domain. Um, and our licenses are considerably more complicated than CC licenses. Ownership can be split. Um, and we do store basic, basic social networking data to allow uh, users of our system to be able to communicate things like favorites and stuff. So all that's a little bit out of scope. This is way out of scope. <laughs> um, this is our, our ERD for the database, which gives you an idea of general ideas. Um, and uh, this is um, some notes on our API. So we are trying to be as webby as possible. We're presenting uh, entities 
uh, as uh, URLs that are uh, essentially permanent. Um, we have four major classes of entities which correspond to um, copyrighted works, collections of works, agents who are essentially people or companies, um, and groups, uh, sorry, tags and groups. Um, and then those uh, resources which are relevant to any one of those uh, major categories, like uh, an item, which would be a, a copyrighted work, are subordinate. So an item like Stairway to Heaven might have any number of separate recordings um, in various formats. Those formats are instances which are, are located in URLs that are subordinate to the top-level URL for the work. Um, so there's a lot of detail to the, um, to the uh, REST interface design, but we've really tried to stay to uh, essential Web 2.0 sorts of uh, um, <coughs> principles. Um, what we did wind up doing, though, is rolling our own XML. So this was after uh, an, a lot of time evaluating the options that were available. Um, and at that point, we, uh, we actually did some prototyping in RDFA, um, but it was a little bit early for RDFA. And um, uh, we wound up uh, coming up with a, with a separate uh, human-readable representation and machine-readable representation. Um, obviously, um, we see the promise of RDFA as an ideal to aspire to, and uh, we're um, very excited to take part in, um, uh, in, in that process. Um, I think I should probably pretty much wrap up there. Here, here's an example. This is, this is some of our hand-rolled API. As you can see, we have a um, a unique URL for this particular audio item, which is a speech from the Berkman Center on, from the Beyond Broadcast 2007 conference. Um, and we have some uh, metadata of various sorts, tagging descriptions, and it's available in multiple languages. Um, and uh, I don't think I have time to go into any more detail than that. So um, I'll uh, leave it there and move on to the next, uh, next folks. Thanks, Devin. Uh, so up next we have Rob K. Okay. Who is going slideless? Yes. No need to bore you guys with more slides. Um, all right. I'm Robert K. from Music Brains. How many of you guys are familiar with Music Brains? Raise your hand. Oh, wow. That's cool. Thank you. Um, so in that case, I'll keep the introduction relatively short because it seems like most people know what's going on. Um, the, it originally started off with me being pissed off at Gracenote. Gracenote took uh, a project that I uh, contributed several hundred CDs to. They took it private. So they started charging people money for it and started throwing lots of lawyers at it. And it got really ugly really quickly. Um, I dislike that. And I said, uh, what's the open source alternative to this? And I started my own one called uh, the CD Index. Um, it was very quickly shown that that was a bit uh, simplistic in the thinking. Not much thought about communities went into it. And um, uh, in 2000, I actually went and said, all right, uh, CDs are dead. Um, it's all about actually creating um, information for music and uh, about MP3s. So let's actually create this a new project with a proper structure called Music Brains. Um, the idea is basically that we have, we know which artists exist, what they've released, when they've released it, where they released it. Um, we're starting to gather information about who performed what on which album, which type of vocals. Uh, we also have minimal support for uh, figuring out if there is music that's released under Creative Commons license and you, should, you can search for that information and so forth. Um, uh, unfortunately, on the Creative Commons stuff, we haven't had too much uptake yet. But I think, hopefully, as a result of uh, some of the discussions today, we'll see more of that uptake and more cooperation, and closer cooperation with the Creative Commons. Um, the um, Music Brains and Creative Commons have actually shared a bit of a history in the, in the past. Um, they uh, pulled me in early in the beginning and said, hey, we need partners that would like to you know, use our data or uh, use our licenses. And it was, uh, it was ironic, right about the time that I was starting to get into the project, I realized that, wow, some of my data is not copyrightable in this country. European laws are a little bit different. I don't really know what's going on. It's very complicated. I'm not a lawyer. And I needed a license. And I needed uh, you know, not just one license, but multiple licenses licenses that would give me a lot of flexibility. And then the Creative Commons came in and gave me literally a boom, here's a set of licenses to work with. And it was literally um, my salvation. They saved me a lot of trouble, a lot of hassle, and inadvertently actually completely um, 
gave rise to my business model, which uh, I'll explain later. I won't take time for it right now, but I think I may have inadvertently created the first 100% profit nonprofit business model. It's a mouthful. It's a little interesting, but uh, thank you, Creative Commons. It's really cool. I don't actually do anything to fulfill the needs of my customers. All I need to do is put the check in the bank. It's a really good system. I recommend it. <laughs> All right, so uh, early in the beginning, one of the things I was really excited about with the Creative Commons was a copyright registry. Uh, how can you have these licenses without a copyright registry is what I said. And because uh, it's so important to actually find the content. Uh, unfortunately, there were, um, and no offense to the Creative Commons folks, but too many lawyers involved with the Creative Commons and uh, the issues of liability were brought up very quickly and the idea was just killed. And that really kind of bugged me a lot. So, you know, I went off my corner and I worked on Music Rates, continued working on that, um, and not so much, you know, worried about uh, working on a copyright registry with the Creative Commons. Now, why is Music Brains really relevant in this discussion? Well, I've learned a few things. Number one, Music Brains is all about metadata. And metadata is about findability. If you don't have good metadata, you can't find the content. It doesn't exist. I think we all implicitly know this, that, you know, look at Flickr. There's millions and millions of pictures of Flickr. If they don't have tags, if they don't have actual descriptions, you can't find them. They don't exist. Right? So if you don't have good metadata, the data doesn't exist. So how do you come up with good metadata? And that's actually surprisingly hard to do. And as Mike pointed out in his slide, if you don't do it right, you end up with meta crap, which is almost worse than no metadata. And that can get you into liability issues and lots of hot water really quickly. So what do we do that actually works best with Music Brains? Well, Music Brains is not about software. It's not about hardware. It's not about me. It's about the community. It's a whole bunch of people that are working on the data that are manicuring data. So why are people interested in manicuring this, this meta database that, we, that we're working on? Well, the key, and I think this is, this is an important lesson that everybody should walk away with today, is that we provide a uh, value proposition that makes sense. Uh, people come in and um, using our taggers or using third-party taggers that are Music Brains enabled, they can run their, through their music collection and their music collection as a part of it will then get cleaned up, has clean metadata tags. It's organized properly on the directory uh, on the directory structure on your machine you can actually find things so we have a lot of people that come to us and said hey I got an iPod it's supposed to be the greatest thing since sliced bread and well I can't find my music this is crap I can't find this what's going on well you have a metadata problem so once they actually run their collection through the music brains taggers and whatnot they can find their music metadata and they're really happy well Part of that value proposition of them getting their music metadata cleaned up is that we don't allow them to actually clean up their metadata without making fixes to the database. So if you find something that's missing, if you find something that, uh, that needs adding or something that's wrong, we give the power to the people to actually go clean that up. Couple that with a peer review system and this value proposition gives people a lot of value back for doing a little bit of work. It's like Wikipedia, but it actually has much more tangible benefits to the user in the form of your music collection, your music enjoyment will actually go up when you have cleaner metadata. <clears throat> there's lots of people that recognize the value proposition and they start participating in it. And as an end result, we see in Music Brains that our music metadata is actually getting better every day and it keeps getting better and better. Um, in the beginning, we had a lot of people saying, that, oh, Music Brains is a bunch of crap. That was about four or five years ago. And now if you actually start looking for searches on Music Brains data quality, the pendulum is swinging to the opposite side. There are some people now claiming that Music Brains has the best music metadata out there. I'm not sure if we've arrived there yet, but hopefully at some point we can. Uh, it's, our, it's certainly an uh, indicator that we're doing something right and we're moving in the right direction. So ultimately, this is... We figured out how to do metadata and any kind of copyright registry, the key is to get the metadata right. Because if you don't have the metadata right, you can't find the content. So I've got lots more thoughts on how we can actually take, a, um, take some of these concepts that Music Brands has developed and take some of these concepts and some of the existing registries and existing projects that we can hear about in a minute and hopefully tie these together to actually become part of the web of data uh, rather than the Creative Commons operating one copyright registry. So I hope we'll get into some of those discussions as part of this panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so up next is uh, Joe Benso from uh, Registered Commons. And um, I, I don't know, Joe may actually be vying for the award for like furthest traveled for uh, the Tech Summit. So. Oh. 
<laughs> I, I'm um, fine okay. for that. You're fine for it. Okay. So, uh, Joe Bento. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I have traveled a long way. My name is Joe Benso from Registered Commons. Uh, it's good to be back in the U.S. Uh, Registered Commons is actually based in Austria. Um, pretty nice location uh, near the Swiss uh, and Austrian Alps. Uh, actually close to the, um, the Google Zurich headquarters, so it's a nice place to work, and I've been spending the last year working with Registered Commons and uh, an organization, organization called OS Alliance um, uh, that operates Registered Commons uh, out of Austria. And uh, I, I lived a little bit in, in California, so it's nice to be back in, in a sunny state. Um, <clears throat> my focus uh, mainly with Registered Commons is uh, more on the business development side of things and not necessarily the, the technical development side of things. Um, so I'll try to uh, address any techni technical issues as much as, uh, as, much as I can. Um, but to give you a little bit of uh, a quick background and a brief overview of uh, what Registered Commons does, um, uh, we are a registry system. Um, we launched as, a, as an early adopter, I guess you would say, uh, in, the, in the registry field uh, space. Uh, in 2006, uh, at the Wizards of uh, Open Source Conference in Berlin, um, uh, with the support of iCommons, um, uh, and Heather Ford from iCommons uh, had some good support. Uh, it was a successful launch there. Um, uh, and we saw a need for uh, a need for verifica uh, verifiable content registration, um, especially for users who need uh, uh, an assurance of trust uh, from content that they use, um, uh, content that they need to license. Uh, for example, companies that need to license works for commercial use. Uh, and I'll get into a little bit uh, later detail about um, uh, where we're headed uh, in that field. So we feel that the, the actual commercial use uh, of content um, let's just use the example of, uh, of, of music uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a model that we're, uh, we hope to work with uh, uh, for future development. <clears throat> um, so our organizational structure um, is, is unique uh, um, uh, and I think ideally suited for a registry uh, in that we have a, a transparent uh, governance uh, structure. We're operated by a a public-private partnership through universities uh, in Austria, as well as uh, an alliance of um, uh, IT organizations and media companies, mostly European-based uh, companies, uh, th that operate as a, as a co-op, uh, and anybody can become uh, a cooperative member uh, to the organization um, uh, and have a, a voter's um, uh, share. Um, so we operate with uh, transparency, and we feel that this is uh, important uh, for content registries um, like ours uh, to, to be able to earn the trust uh, of users uh, and to succeed in this field. Um, so what we provide currently, um, and the features anybody can register uh, for free, by the way. Uh, it's a free service um, uh, to register um, works of any type. Um, and as uh, users upload their work, uh, what we automatically do as a result of their upload is uh, we keep a backup of that uh, content uh, on our servers. Um, uh, okay, and so we provide also a, a timestamp service uh, that is uh, provided by a, uh, a company called Acert. Um, so they're issued by a, a legally, they issue certific, uh, time stamping, uh, legally recognized uh, certificate provider. Um, so ACERT uh, was chosen um, uh, for us to use. So we, uh, uh, you can obtain um, uh, the timestamp online and in real time. And it's, uh, it's offered for download and can be validated uh, by a corresponding client. Um, it's, uh, used in, in governments and, and large org organizations uh, across Europe. And so we decided uh, to go with uh, ACERT as the secured uh, time stamping uh, authority. Um, CCERT uh, is another uh, verification process that we uh, verify users' identities through um, uh, to gain trust levels of who is actually uploading the work, who owns this work, um, are they who they who they say they are? Um, so we have different levels of uh, trust verification. The first and least um, 
uh, I guess, uh, least strong level of verification is through uh, email. Uh, we verify the user's email address, uh, and users can then go on to verify uh, their identity through um, uh, uh, a stronger verification process. Uh, CA CERT is an Australian based organization, community based organization, um, that essentially uh, 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 has users um, obtain a certificate. Uh, to uh, by presenting documents that are corroborated by at least two other CA CERT members. So actual proof of physical identity uh, is essential for verifying uh, uh, this person. Um, and so that, that would be the highest level of trust uh, involved. And so once the levels of trust increase for a user, uh, we feel that uh, users are then able to uh, use their works uh, in different in different ways, especially for commercial purposes, when companies need to uh, make sure they are licensing the work uh, from the from the person they say they're licensing it from. Um, so we are already compatible with CC licensing scheme. Um, we promote uh, CC licenses actively, uh, and we're already using uh, our, the metadata uh, RDF scheme. And here's just a quick uh, couple snapshots. We're using the C uh, Creative Commons API for users to uh, choose their licenses. Um, and they can uh, put in the, uh, their information about their work. And we issue them a certificate, uh, which they can then link to uh, on, on their page, uh, link back to their work. Users can also uh, determine beforehand if they want the work to be uh, visible or invisible. So if you upload an MP3, but you don't want uh, uh, that work to be streamed or downloaded. Uh, you can just uh, link back to the meta, uh, metadata of the work uh, and the information uh, of the license. Um, another thing with the license is we provide uh, a field where uh, the users can include moral rights. Uh, so for example, um, if, if somebody licenses their work under Creative Commons, um, uh, they can attribute uh, another um, uh, 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 factor in, into that by saying, well, you can use it, but we don't want you to use it in a, uh, a fascist book or something, even though uh, that might fall within the realm of uh, what the license provides. <clears throat> so uh, the moral rights uh, is something that we thought um, uh, was important for us to offer to the, to the users as well. Uh, some of the challenges that we see going ahead uh, in, this, in this space, especially as uh, more registries emerge in the field, um, and, and the fact that um, it, it, there's, there's not any standards set forth yet right now in terms of uh, uh, policies um, or uh, uh, best practices in this field. So um, to determine what those best use practices are, uh, uh, establishing policies for registries, and uh, possibly if the approach is to go towards a, a registration authority of some sort, um, uh, what would that look like, and uh, how would that incorporate uh, new and emerging registries as, and, and others? And would, would these registries um, necessarily uh, have to promote Creative Commons licenses? Um, and also new business models um, around uh, a registration system. So uh, Register Commons uh, is still a small uh, organization. Uh, uh, with the intention of uh, growing, so it provides uh, uh, services for new business models. Uh, and so, one of the one of the models that uh, we found uh, uh, some interest for uh, comes by way of the Austrian Chamber of Commerce um, uh, that we we hope could provide a, a model for other uh, city chambers of commerce, either in, in Europe or also in the states. Um, and so what they're doing is uh, um, the creative, uh, this creative sector promotes uh, or promotes their creative sector, the Austrian Chamber of Commerce, uh, by purchasing um, uh, registrations, uh, vouchers uh, from Registered Commons. So we're going to be moving into uh, um, a limited paid registration service as well. Um, and our focus is primarily right now for universities. Um, and again, uh, cities, chambers uh, of commerce uh, to 
to purchase their registrations for their users beforehand and then offer these uh, offer their users or the creative community vouchers uh, to go ahead and, and register register their works uh, uh, through registered commons um, so we're also uh, going to be incorporating CC plus um, uh, soon um, oh, by the way the uh, this branded version of RC is, is called Creative Depot. That's the, uh, the Austrian Chamber of Commerce um, uh, creative uh, service that I just mentioned. Um, CC Plus uh, is, is also on the horizon where we, uh, we believe that by using this and also allowing uh, third party uh, businesses, uh, content clearing services, um, to use the services of, of Registered Commons to register um, uh, their work uh, and then offering commercial uh, commercial use on top of uh, um, a trusted uh, registration. So one one example that we're moving forward on right now uh, within this organization uh, that operates uh, Registered Commons uh, is a project called Pod Perfect, uh, where uh, what we're doing is is uh, uh, is based on a, a music collaboration community similar to uh, probably CC Mixter, um, where we. Uh, register the works uh, from the users and give the, uh, the artists and the users the, the option to uh, form agreements between each other and license their work for commercial use and uh, allow um, uh, commercial entities to come in and, uh, and efficiently in a, and a streamline process license this work from, uh, from the artists in the community. And Register Commons would be the basis for um, the trusted registration uh, providing um, uh, uh, a secure way for these commercial companies to know that the content that they're getting, the content they're going to pay for, is uh, content that comes from the original author, uh, the original source. And so uh, that's where we're going. So thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, uh, so up next, we have uh, Javier. Uh, I'll, I'm sure I'm going to get your last name wrong. Is it Prenefeta? <laughs> um, I'm terrible with American names. So, um, uh, from Safe Creative, uh, who's they are also um, doing a running a registry service at this time. They're going to talk a little bit about uh, what they're doing. Well, thanks for inviting us. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about Safe Creative, it's a registry of copyrighted works similar to registered commons. Well, why safe creative? Lawyers are living happy days because intellectual properties may, may be one of the most important now issues now on the internet. So as a space where users uh, like to create and share the works worldwide, the first legal steps are may be done as we have many license systems and platforms to allow the exploitation of copyrighted works uh, for advance. So, but uh, look at farm problems. As license or contract establish the rights, they do not solve many other problems and so that's why we think a registry could be a solution. For example, just three points. How can a user demonstrate, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, how can a user demonstrate that he used one work according to a license? So uh, when, in a context that uh, the, the creator can change this license easily or change the, uh, the content of the work. So. You need some kind of proof. And one thing that uh, someone in Benadida's talk has pointed out is um, how can a creator demonstrate that he is the author of a work or the copyright holder in a context that uh, where uh, works are shared freely and anyone could claim an authorship of a copyrighted work. So we think the register uh, has two functions mainly proof, uh, proof of authorship and um, a proof of the, the um, copyright rights well, copyright licenses uh, link it to the to the content so how it works 
SafeCreative provides a worldwide online easy, neutral, and free register. We insist in the, in the aspect of neutrality because uh, once you upload or save the, the work on our servers, you can choose between uh, many, well, you can define your copyright policy, choosing between copyright or uh, Secret Commons licenses or GNU licenses, so what? GPL, LGPL, FDL, for example. And so it's neutral in this sense. Free because it's have no cost. Everyone asks why is our business model, but I don't think I'm going to talk about it. So um, it's a platform of self management of uh, exploitation rights in this sense. So, technology. I think I'm going to be a bit quickly, but. Our platform uh, is uh, developing, developing uh, advanced identification system from a simple email to digital certificates. Uh, we uh, identify creators as they log in uh, our system. So, Certificates also uh, give are more accurate, the more deep, the more confidence of the identification process. So, uh, the quality of the certificates are related to uh, the author's attitude. Communications between in login process, in sign up, or in, in the platform actions are profile are encrypted. So, by sign. So it's a warranty of quality. Also, our databases are storage complies with ISO, I think it's 27,001, and are audited every six months. That's the more, maybe the more important uh, question. Uh, once the work is uploaded and saved on the servers, the system obtains two hash functions, two different hash functions for every single work. That we link to document metadata as author's identification, uh, type of work, title of work, description of work, type of li li license, and we obtain a uh, time stamping of all the, the, the hash functions and metadata. And after that, a certification of the content will be provided digitally signed by Safe Creative. So you see the process. Well, Prejudice Tools. We are continually developing these, these facilities. One of the most used is Book Market. Well, I think you could see. Um, we have developed two Book Markets for Internet Explorer and from Firefox, so you can uh, upload content easily on Blogger or WordPress. So, you. Uh, you uh, add your the bookmarklet on on the on the navigator toolbar, and so in the administration side of uh, WordPress, you can click the button and the content is uploaded to the server. So you can see content is so on the right side. You can choose between the license, you can add the title, description, etc., and after that, in the right side, you can see our register labels. It's very simple. From desktop, you also could uh, upload works like uh, drag and drop systems. So you can you have to sign in, save creative, enable lag features because it's maybe uh, it's now uh, we are developing and testing now works, but we have to check deeper. You have to choose bulk registry, and you have to accept an applet, and you can uh, upload content more more quickly and uh, all, all time, well, more than one work in a, in a chance. CCRL, 
We now include CCRL in our web pages. This one page of, of uh, register work. You see the number, the code, the name, it's an well, it's a example. But this now complies CCRL, as you can see. And register labels also comply with CCRL. See the code? In, in this sense, We'd like to, we think this could be a good opportunity to uh, add attributes of uh, registries on CCRL. And I think it would be a good opportunity to find out, as said my, well, registered comments, to find out standards and policies for registries. So we think uh, it could be very useful to share content and to um, provide more facilities to find out where one work is registered and which are the, the license selected. So that's all. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. Thanks, Javier. Thanks. Um, so we have a couple more um, presenters that are going to do quick presentations, and then we will have time uh, for uh, questions for everybody as a group. Um, so up next is Rich Pearson from attributor.com. And uh, in contrast to the last couple of presenters, attributor is uh, um, building a registry at, my perception at least is that it's building a registry as a side effect of the other work they're doing. So I'm uh, <coughs> me, interested in uh, hearing what Rich has to say. So Nathan's right in that uh, what a tributor really is is we're a GPS for your content. And um, we've started with, uh, let's say, the, the higher end publishers where uh, large companies who are publishing a lot of data, we are rapidly moving to where anyone who publishes data from your blogger to your individual photographer can uh, register uh, their content with us. And uh, to speak to Nathan's specific point, our f we have a fee structure that's based on monitoring the content. Um, so uh, essentially, uh, based on the amount of content that you want to perform, and if you want to take an action ever on this content, then, then there's a monthly subscription fee. So that's kind of the, the pitch. I mean, I've got a couple uh, slides on how we do that, and uh, then we can get to questions, because I think that's the most interesting part. So. This is a chart on how we identify content. As you look up, uh, we have a, uh, a lot of iron that's doing the crawling. And specifically, we've got very dedicated crawls. We're going against blogs. We're going against the news sites. Uh, if we have a customer vertical that we need to do very well at, we'll, we'll use that. And then also just the general web. And then our customers uh, typically provide us some type of RSS feed, but we can also crawl uh, sites as well. And we have a number of small publisher sites that we're in beta right now where we're just crawling their site. There's a lot of challenges in that in terms of making sure that we extract the important bits and not the footer text. So we've got a lot of template cleaner issues. But that's, a, that's an ongoing process. And then uh, we're essentially a, a giant database uh, matching service. So we find matches and we provide the, con the, provide the context of the matches. And that's what's interesting from the Creative Commons perspective. We'll detect attribution. We'll detect if there's ads on the page. We'll also detect what percentage was copied so you can make your decisions uh, if they're following your licenses. Uh, this is definitely not to scale, but uh, just, just, just a point on in, in, in how, we, uh, how, we, how frequently we crawl. And you can look at you know, from the general web to uh, topic specific. We're getting a pretty good feel for building heuristic kind of uh, you know, site reputation type crawling behavior where if a, if a certain site has uh, done something in the past, whether it's a licensee or an unlicensed site, we'll, we, may, we may go back there uh, more frequently. And obviously, uh, customers and users drive, drive what we're doing. From a user perspective, this, this is another way of looking at it. So you plug in your content, we match it, and then you decide what you want to do with it. And there's four actions identified right there that we can enable. Uh, directly th from our uh, con from our uh, service, we're increasingly trying to get publishers to treat this as an absolute last resort option. Uh, there was news this week uh, 
with the AP where that wasn't a last resort option for them. So we're an ag agnostic platform and uh, it's going to surface a lot of issues. And uh, we think that uh, by supporting uh, the transparency that, that, that the Commons is about, we can uh, hopefully help solve some of them and educate the publishers at the same time. Clearly an opinion-based slide here, um, but we believe that the registry has to be an interoperable. I think Mike said that earlier, and uh, a disjointed collection of micro uh, registries won't work. It's gotta be open to all uh, uh, rights holders of all sizes, and, and we believe it should be free, and we will support a free registry service. The monitoring up to a certain level will also be free. Once you go beyond that, uh, and if you want to take actions, that's, that's how we make money, so that's clearly our focus. We support mul multiple licensing standards. We will support the commons and normalize against their rules, so a customer who has their content in, or a user, can see if their content licenses and their uh, commons licenses are being followed. And then, uh, particularly on the photo side, uh, there's a lot of agencies involved. Uh, we believe to make these registries queryable and uh, using a combination of metadata, as, as has been discussed, uh, is probably the best approach. That's it for me. Thank you. Uh, so up next we have uh, Aaron Swartz from Open Library, and uh, this is I don't Aaron. Do you have slides or anything you need to do? Okay, so uh, I'll turn it over to Aaron then. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, we're getting late in the panel, so I'll just skip slides and try and be somewhat interesting. Um, Open Library was a project created and funded by the Internet Archive to try and build a website that had a page for every book ever published. And so if you think about what it takes to build a website with a page for every book ever published, you really need a lot of help from other partners. So we've partnered with people like the Wikimedia Foundation and Creative Commons. We've partnered with publishers and libraries. We've tried to get as much data as possible from as many different sources, import it all into one big website, and then we made it into a wiki so that anyone in the public can go and edit it. Um, you can go see it now. It's at openlibrary.org. There are 20 million books in it. Each one has a full web page with all the data we've been able to collect from all these various sources, mostly from people like the Library of Congress and the various publishing companies. Um, and there's an edit link on every page that you can go and add more details, add table of contents or descriptions or images, whatever you want. It's all available through an API, so partners who want book data can query it. Libraries who want to put cover images on their websites can reuse those. And we, in partnership with Creative Commons, have been trying to add copyright data so that we can calculate based on the date the book was published or whether you say it has a copyright notice or not or whether it was renewed, try and calculate the current copyright status of a book so that you can see if it's in the public domain or if it's still in copyright or if it's under a Creative Commons license or anything like that. Um, for many of the books in the public domain, about half a million of them, we've scanned them and digitized them. The full text is online. There are pictures. You can flip through the books. Um, and we're encouraging people to kind of upload new books, upload anything that they've got. Right now, um, we're working in partnership with the Wikimedia Foundation to integrate support with Wikipedia so that when you see the citations at the bottom of a page, we can replace those with links to Open Library and use that as kind of the back-end storage for all the citation data and all the discussion that goes around citations on Wikipedia. So we're really trying to create this big, open community platform for metadata, you know, and we want it to be available through APIs, through data dumps, through web pages, through whatever formats we can, so that everybody who wants information about, you know, published works, whether it's copyright information or simply bibliographical information or even the full text, um, can get it easily and through one simple place. Thanks. And uh, finally, um, we have uh, Pierre Girard from Jamendo. Okay, I'm from Jamendo. I'm Pierre, one of the three founders of Jamendo. Jamendo is a, one of the biggest online free music community. We are surely the first one in Europe. Today, Jamendo and is uh, brand new because uh, we are reaching today 10,000 albums available online for free under a CC license. We are growing up of, from um, about 300 new albums per week. And uh, we, have, we are offering more than 150,000 tracks. Music is coming from 60 countries, let's say coming from all around the world. 
We are located in Luxembourg and uh, part of the team is in Paris. We are 25 and we have been funded by Mangrove, who were the early baker of Skype. So quickly, Jamendo <coughs> for users is you can discover music for free, you can download it, you can share it, you can invite your friends, uh, you can, you, of course, review and uh, integrate in your blog with a brand new widget. If you are really <coughs> happy with the music, you can also make a donation and you say uh, pay if you, wi if you, you wish. Donation it is at least five euro uh, or five dollars, so it's cheaper in dollar. And uh, you are only <laughs> keeping 50 cents. Deal for artists is, to, can, is free. You are hosting the music for free. They just have to choose a Creative Commons license and to accept our terms of usage. Uh, for them, the deal is uh, quite cool because you are sharing 50% of our advertising revenue with them. It's not a lot today, but uh, it's always growing up. We have, it's also a way to get coverage because um, our Music for Jamendo is, for example, available via uh, MP3 devices like uh, Arcos. And um, we are really working on the partnership to um, to try to build an individual right management on Jamendo. So if um, we are able to, let's say, sell music from uh, an artist on Jamendo, uh, we want really to pay him um, and to share more than 50% of the revenue. Let's say, like, a direct license for him. Current project is music recommendation because 10,000 uh, 10, albums are very, uh, it's a very long process to browse and to listen to all of them. So music recommendation means that you just type uh, a band that you like, for example, Radiohead, and tweet, it will lead you to uh, Samsara. This stuff is working today. And then from this band to find other bands on Jamendo. We're also working on official playlist and uh, a new feature for artists to build like a, an artist buzz center and to create more interaction between them and the fans. Of course, we are working and trying to integrate CC Plus in the coming months. So certification is a problem, as uh, many said before. Uh, we need really to know with the, the right, right order of the, of the music that is uh, online on Jamendo. Uh, sometimes they don't really understand what is a Creative Commons license. They don't know uh, it's impossible for them uh, to choose a Creative Commons license because they are already member of a collecting society in Europe, for example. So we need to work on so the new projects from next week and next month to know more, to get more information for them. If, if you want to share money with them, of course, we really need to know that they are, they are the right guy. So we are sp speaking about a level of, of confidence of the certification. The music is available um, via BitTorrent and via HTTP download. Uh, for full album, it's uh, now also available via st straight HTTP download. You can stream music; it's very, very easy with our Ajax player, for example. And you can also uh, integrate our widget, and our widget is uh, showing the license of any uh, playlist of in, of the song that is uh, played. Of course, with a link uh, to a description on the CC website. We are. Opening our data with the APIs, so the developer.jamendo.com, it's really easy to access to our catalog. And you can get a lot of information about artist name, cover art, um, the, uh, type of license, and it returns a lot of uh, different formats that people like. For example, to get all the specific license for Germany, UK, all the albums, you get very easy to just send the URL and you get information with the right format. Also get a license for a specific album. Just send the album ID and you get also uh, the links and the description of, um, of the license. So the freshest ears listen to Jamendo is it's my last slide. <laughs> Advertising campaign of your software.
Thanks. So uh, we obviously, obviously have a lot of different approaches to the uh, registry question. Uh, at this time, uh, we'd like to open up for questions and discussion with our panel. And um, we have about uh, 25 minutes, so plenty of time for that. Uh, if you have a question, please come to the mic so, we, uh, so everybody can hear what they are and so we can get these on, on the record or whatever. So um, I was curious, actually, for uh, Rob and Aaron both, since you're running um, sort of media-specific uh, registries or metadata repositories, have you had any interest from um, like mainstream publishers or creators like giving you data up front, like with Music Brains, for example, giving you, uh, um, you know, sort of feeding into as part of the production process? There's a little bit of a delay when they come on. Um, <clears throat> Music Brains uh, specifically hasn't. Um, we've had actually sort of the reverse happen where we've had a lot of people come to us and say, hey, why don't you guys go talk to the labels and get data from the labels? Um, and uh, with the exception of Gemendo and, and Magnatune, that's essentially uh, a, a pointless exercise because a lot of the labels have absolutely crappy data. Uh, case in point, back in the Napster case, uh, the judge basically said, provide us with lists of information, a list of content that we should block. And they provided the judge lists of content that contained stuff from other people, stuff that they didn't have copyright for, and they, they omitted large chunks of their own content. Ergo, they don't really know what they have in their own repositories. And uh, they don't really have this, the computer scientists and the geeks working on this type of stuff. They're musicians and business people and so forth. So their data keeping practices are pretty poor. So my community wouldn't want that data. <laughs> the world in the, uh, in the book industry is actually a lot better. The publishers seem to have real data because they supply it to places like Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and Powell's. So there is an incentive to actually get it right. And in fact, we've been working with them. And so they have this XML format called Onyx. And every week, they send us a, a new XML file with all the new books that have come out. And, full covers and blurbs and about the author and all of that. So we've been importing that as it comes in, and that's been very useful. Um, we're hoping at some point to branch out beyond books and kind of cover other kinds of things in libraries, but it's been much easier in the book world, you know, for a lot of the reasons Robert talks about, where there's, you know, a long history of librarians going and cataloging things in particular ways and coming up with standards and formats that makes everything a whole lot easier. saw them uh, coming through the back channel IRC uh, room, so. Uh, well, I got a question. Okay. While we're waiting. Um, I actually have a question for Rich. Um, <clears throat> I think um, in your application, um, one of the things that seems like it maybe isn't happening now, but it's something that would be ideal, is to have the content creators be able to specify commercial license terms. And um, I'm wondering if there's uh, standards or uh, dictionaries or things that you're looking at as being a viable means of uh, expressing that kind of information? So absolutely, uh, in addition to the Commons license, uh, we will be supporting several. We're not going to come up with our own. Yeah, our yeah. job is not to come up with our own. Our job is to build the back end so we can show you where it is. So we are open uh, and actually actively courting license standards that we can, that we can use. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to, I mean, I really believe in that sort of continuum and, and trying to establish that continuum. So I kind of, I'm trying to find out what, what happens with, with CC, uh, CC RHEL, you know, if that sort of general framework can be extended to commercial licenses. I don't know, Nathan, if you want to um, Oh, CC RHEL and commercial not. licenses? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, so I mean, I, there's not, well, I, mean, I guess you can think about it in two different, two uh, different um, approaches with it. One of them is just describing a license using CC rel, right. using some I'm of the existing vocabulary. Just talking about it, it, well, right. So, I mean, so obviously anybody can describe a li any license using the vocabulary we put together and can extend it with their own, you know, like Ben was talking about, yeah. with their own schema and that kind of thing. Uh, and then the other actual, you know, sort of hook that's in there is this more permissions um, attribute, which lets you just say, here's a URL you can go to. This is what we've been call we kind of calling CC plus, um, right, right. which is you know, if you you're making it available under a CC license, and there's some other license that you can either a place you can go to purchase different a myriad of rights, or 
some particular license available. Right, but, but right now it's like here's the URL for commercial rights, and there be dragons. We don't we don't have any way of uh, well, sure. So specifying so what you those what are. you could do is you could that could actually point to a web page where um, that had embedded metadata describing what it was, and so then you could use a machine readable um, or a software agent to um, to kind of traverse that URL. And look for the for look for the CC rel described license, and you know provide that to the information to the user. So that would be that would be a way to do it. But the CCL vocabulary right now isn't capable of, of describing those kinds of licenses. Uh, well, I'm not sure. It's um, it's not targeted at it, sure, and sure, so sure. I mean, you could use the parts of it, and you probably have to augment it in yeah, other ways. Yeah. Right. So we have we have questions from the audience. Yeah. So, um, my question is for a tributor. Um, in the area of academics, there's a big problem of trying to find out who's downloading and who's using certain articles so that you can report back to a tenure committee or something like that. There's a lot of resistance to post anywhere but SSRN, which tracks downloads. Have you worked with the academic community at all to try to find, identify that information and report back useful statistics on those things? The short answer is no, not yet. Um, we. Uh, we crawl the public web very well. As you know, within the academic communities, we need permission. And uh, there's little incentive for one university to say, crawl us um, without uh, everyone banding together. So we're hoping that a, a community and a standard uh, uh, emerges and, and we can take advantage of that. But okay. very open to it if anyone has contacts or knows, knows folks who are trying to do that, we'd, we'd be very open to work with them. Thank you. Hey, Wendy Seltzer uh, from Berkman Center. And I uh, saw the level of confidence uh, come up in a few of the presentations. And I was wondering uh, whether any of you are offering uh, insurance or bonding type functions to assure people of the level of confidence um, that you assert about the, the works posted there, or the copyright status, <coughs> doing a sort of clearance function. It's the same for everybody. Do. Um, what is the level of confidence you can uh, give to, Wanda can give to Madonna, for example, because uh, she's downloaded every day with uh, BitTorrent. So we have the same, we can offer only uh, what the author can offer, so it's very hard now to manage where the music is played, for example. It can be online, it can be offline. Is there a question? Yeah. Uh, I am also uh, the right question. I, I, I was sort of thinking about for people who want to reuse works, we hear uh, sometimes, um, particularly from commercial reusers or those who have to go through intermediaries like broadcasters, we want to know where this comes from and we want you to indemnify us against uh, the damages Brilliant. if somebody sues us for using it. Um, does any of you sort of take on that liability, usually for a fee, um, of we will do the investigation and uh, assure you that if you're sued for using this content, we will uh, pick that up? We pass on that liability to the people who register with us. <laughs> uh, I can take a stab. Um, regis at Registered Commons, um, uh, uh, are you asking a bit uh, about uh, the authenticity of the, the author and the ownership of their work, um, whether or not uh, we can provide uh, full um, trust uh, as to whether the, the authors are who they are and they, uh, and they own the work that they do, or rather that we, if there's fraudulent claims of ownership, that we go ahead and step in and offer some sort of legal service or... Uh, be an intermediary between the, the court system and uh, and the the law there. M more the first question okay. of, and <clears throat> it, it might be a service that you choose not to offer, which would be uh, fine to know. I, w I was just curious whether it was a service that any of you had heard demand for. I think um, from our standpoint, we just allow the, the, the copyright laws uh, to speak for themselves. Uh, if somebody wants to make a fraudulent claim, that's uh, that's you know, their business for committing that crime. Um, <clears throat> we can uh, offer just trust, uh, trusted levels uh, up to uh, a certain point uh, as um, uh, the author is who they say they are and we have physically 
uh, been able to verify their identity and that they, they actually own that content. So um, we haven't found that there's, any, there, there's really too many problems uh, um, with uh, questions of, of user identity, especially when we get into higher levels of um, uh, trust uh, verification. Um, but uh, yeah. Okay. So you don't validate the claim itself, you validate the fact that this identified person is making this claim. Uh, yeah, and it's up to them if, if um, well, we do, we do actually have a system in place where uh, the, the CA cert verifies, uh, you know, this person is the physical person who they say they are, and we actually make a physical connection between that and uh, you have to be... <coughs> and the hash of the file. And the, and the hash of the file yeah. as well, yeah. We have heard this uh, from ad agencies, particularly in our image business, ad agencies uh, look for this type of liability. Uh, or protection. We do not offer it. I don't think we will. We would prefer not to offer that um, if it becomes a must-have, perhaps, but right now, no. Well, according to legal capacity or personality of the, the user, we, the, there are different st levels of karma and accuracy according to uh, email or digital certificates for identification, but if I don't think if you're, you're talking about um, user's attitude of he or well if he's really the, the author or the copyright holder or not i think any registry can control these things well in if you sign in safe creative you accept the terms of you uh, where you declare that you are the author or you have the copyrights but don't think I think it's, it's a really important question because I think without a, a sufficient answer to the question, we're going to have ad agencies and whatnot look at this and go, oh, you right, we can't, can't use it. You can't use it. You can't identify it, so therefore we're not going to use it, especially with the light of the fiasco with uh, Virgin Australia. I mean, that's, that's a sticky situation, and it's not about to get any better unless somebody can offer something like that. But I'm looking down the table, and I don't think anybody wants to offer that because I wouldn't want to offer that. So it uh, doesn't spell good things for commercial use of Creative Commons content. Hi, um, I'm Rihanna Pfefferkorn from Wilson Santini, Goodrich and Rosati, and uh, I wanted to ask you about death. Uh, what happens, or what contingency plan do you have if, heaven forfend, one of the registry companies should fold? It seems like at best we're talking about a situation where all of your registry data would be lost, and at, at, sorry, at worst that would happen. At best you're talking about having to sell off your registry information as an asset during liquidation along with the tables and chairs and computers. And this brings up issues of uh, whether you know, transferring these registries would exceed the scope of consent that you made in your user agreements when people signed up with you, um, finding your clients to let them know that you know, their information is switching hands, whether you can get another registry's users to trust the new, the new registry and their authentication, and especially what happens if a free registry moves to a paid registry, whether people would have to re-register, whether they would have to pay it. And so I was just wondering what your contingency plans are. Um, I can uh, first speak on that, and um, as far as registered commons is concerned, uh, for example, the um, uh, new project that we have with the City Chamber of Commerce uh, in Austria, uh, there is a contingency plan uh, in case our servers fail or anything goes down that we uh, uh, at least keep a, uh, a, a record of the certificate uh, on file, a, a paper record. Um, uh, so uh, we are also uh, uh, operated by um, a public-private partnership, so um, we don't foresee any, uh, you know, selling of the, of the companies uh, uh, right now. Um, University of Applied Science in Dornburn, Austria uh, is, is, uh, make, is, is running the, the IT infrastructure at, at this moment. Um, so um, I think that uh, our transparency on that level uh, I think is um, uh, is kind of the first defense against that. 
Now, <clears throat> Music Brains isn't obviously a, a registry, but uh, our answer for longevity or uh, what should happen if I get hit by a bus and the servers go down and whatnot, our data is replicated uh, literally all over the globe. And uh, so you'll be able to download the core data pretty much from um, OSU, OSL, for instance, and other people's uh, machines. So our data is fairly well replicated, but it doesn't quite have the sticky situation that the copyright registries do. Jamendo, we are not a registry, but of course we can now dump, dump our database. It's very easy via the API, for example, to get a lot of information coming from our database. And it's only a 20 gigs dump. So um, we are not, of course, if we are going further in the registration pro registry process, we will increase this level of, um, of confidence and level of security. But um, now we are open. So, um, our platform are open more so. Our platform opens today, so uh, it's not like a proprietary system where everything is closed. Yeah, our, our solution is kind of similar. We provide dumps of the entire database, and since we're part of the Internet Archive, you know, we put them on the archive servers. They get automatically backed up. They make a copy in Amsterdam. They make a copy in the Library of Alexandria, and hopefully, you know, there's enough data in the Internet Archive that someone is going to keep it running, even if, you know, the current organization fails or the people running it go away so that we don't lose the entire archive of the web and television and the 600,000 books that were scanned and all of that. I think there's probably a pretty strong incentive to keep that data going. Hi, I'm uh, Brent Vipper from the Wikimedia Foundation. And one of the things that we'd love to be able to do with copyright registries is to be able to take, uh, for instance, uploaded files that are being put on, say, Wikimedia Commons and be able to verify them against existing registries of files that are either known for certain to be under a you know, Creative Commons or other kind of license, or perhaps are known for certain not to be. Um, but then you run into the basic problem that files may change dramatically. Everything's using lossy formats. If it's been resized, recompressed, you can't necessarily just use a you know, SHA-1 file content hash. So uh, just kind of curious about what the feasibility is on some kind of standard method of doing these content-based lookups for uh, photographs, music, video, et cetera, kind of files. Sure, I'll, uh, I'll speak to that because um, uh, you know, content-based fingerprinting of content is something that we've you know, done as part of our system. Um, and I think just as a fact of the state of the art of the technology right now, uh, the best uh, algorithms for that sort of stuff are all proprietary, mm. and they're backed by proprietary databases of um, the, you know the hashes that are generated by those those fingerprint algorithms. Um, I don't know, you know, maybe if others know about really, I, mean, I know there's been a couple of attempts at open sourced, uh, particularly for audio uh, fingerprinting, but they just don't compete with the proprietary ones, as far as I know. So. They're just not being widely used. Yeah. But I think over time, we're going to see um, you know, open source fingerprinting algorithms being the solution to that problem. Um, to follow up with that, that's pretty much a spot on. There have been a lot of uh, public implementations, open source implementations of, at least in my space, the acoustic fingerprint analysis uh, type of algorithms. The problem is, in order to actually make an algorithm robust like that, you actually have to have a large database of music. And then there's a few people that obviously have a large database of music, but every time you come around to them and say, hey, can I use your music, you, you get a very much a cold shoulder. So as far, this unfortunately is not very suited of a area of expertise for open source development because the resources are simply lacking and or some of the, lo the rights for accessing those resources are lacking. So unfortunately, a lot of information, a lot of tools like that are locked up in proprietary systems. And unfortunately, that's even the case for music brands. Cool. Thanks. Um, that's sort of a, um, I mean, I've had that question when I was listening to both uh, Joe and Javier about whether I, if I had a piece of content I got from somebody, is there a facility I can give you guys the fingerprint, I mean, just the SHA-1 even, and ask if you have it in your database with your API, or is that a service you got, I mean, I, 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 is that a service that's offered by either of your, or any of? Yeah, we'll, we'll allow that. Yeah, okay. But okay. you're, it's not much use. Well, right, yeah, I mean, it's obviously the very limited, I just, it wasn't clear to me what, like, how the, um, how the data could come out of the system. So that's why I was asking. Are there other questions um, for, or amongst each other or from the, from the audience? Uh, 
Uh, one of the registry folks, I'm now sort of blanking on which one, Joe, I think it was you, was talking about uh, a moral rights field in your database. Uh, could you elaborate on that? A couple of us were having problems figuring out how that would work, both with Creative Commons licenses in general and in terms of interoperability, license proliferation, that kind of thing. I think uh, uh, essentially uh, what this could be thought of as uh, kind of uh, similar to what the CC Plus is doing. Uh, in, no, probably not. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, the idea is is to um, allow the author or the owners of the work um, to um, just uh, attribute a, another set of rules for how the work uh, could be used, and when we we say say this is as moral rights. So if somebody uh, in Austria um, licenses their work uh, under Creative Commons um, uh, and there's uh, some fascist magazine that wants to, to or open source uh, uh, weblog that, that, needs, that wants to use it, um, that we, we, we provide the, uh, the artists to say, well, it's not, uh, this work is not used, cannot be used for uh, any, any government uh, ideologies or anything uh, to that matter that, that doesn't uh, uh, fit within what they, you know, their, their moral rights, I guess, for what they want to be used for. I, th I think, if I understand correctly, because when I was talking to Roland about this a little bit, um, there are a bunch of related rights. For instance, with photography, you have, like, to you put it in a more American context, you have model rights and privacy rights and things like that. And I think what you're providing is a field where you can say, I have the model release form here, and I've got the privacy rights there, and here's the part of, because so, when you have a Creative Commons license, you, you really don't have the right to use the photograph without all the other rights. And when you go to Europe, you have all kinds of weird rights that the Creative Commons license really doesn't address at all. We, we say explicitly we have nothing, we say nothing about those things. And so where you can actually get so if you think about it rather than thinking about it as a restriction, but to think about it more as a permission, right? Because without anything, what you're saying is that the author can come back and say, um, I have moral rights, I will exert it now. But if you have the author, although it's actually, it's hard to waive these rights, so it's a little bit more complicated and I'm not a lawyer, but you, can, you could have the author say, at least normatively, that, that this is kind of what I'm sensitive about and this is what I'm not sensitive about. And you've, you've, you've given them extra um, information and so it's easier to use. For instance, I'm doing a portrait book right now, but I'm getting model release forms from everybody in the book and attaching it to the Creative Commons license. So it would be kind of interesting to have a field in the registry where I have the model release form attached along with the Creative Commons license. I think that would be an application, right? Yeah, Does that thank make you. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think uh, that in the license sh should be moral rights because they are not um, transferable according to European law. Well, yeah, no, moral rights are not, they're not in the license. No, so I don't think if, or, or I don't understand what you, if you're saying this. Yeah, so, so it's, not a, it's not a legal thing. It, it's kind of like the, the museum, the public domain assertions that we're making, where you're saying, you don't have to, by law, give me any credit for having scanned this public domain thing, but it would be nice. So similarly, you can say, I do not have the right to waive my moral right but by the way, this is the thing that I would sue you for. So you, you clearly would not use this if you're a fascist magazine. But, but it, so, so it, again, it, it, it's just a, because a lot of what Creative Commons is not about the law, by the way. It's about conveying the intent of the creator to the intent of the user, or to, the intent of the creator to the user. And so insofar as you're expressing more information about how you would like or not like your work to be used, that's additional information that could be useful. And, and, and it wouldn't fit inside the contract, but would, be, would fit inside of a field somewhere else alongside, is I think what, what would be useful, but. Okay. And I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> and uh, with respect to the CC Plus um, thing you mentioned, you know, the CC Plus, uh, I think it can be kind of confusing because it's not intended to be any kind of restriction upon the CC license. It's a completely separate offer that may or may not be, you know, that we're not at all. So, yeah. Um, so we're like right at our time, um, which is good for being on schedule. Uh, if there are no more questions, we're going to go ahead and take a short 15 minute break. And then we'll come back here for um, sort of a wrap up plenary. Um, thanks. <laughs>